today's event is meant to give you some learning and insights into an emerging legal tech industry that's already breaking boundaries and will also probably transfer the legal into the, transform the legal industry sooner or later. I'm sure this session is interesting for many of you here. Let me introduce you. The person who's going to run the event today is uh, Rachel Petha. She's a senior advisor at the Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute. She's a qualified investment professional, television news anchor, CFA charter holder, charter treasurer, member of Mensa, and also a published author. That's a lot, <laughs> Rachel. Anyways, uh, since 2016, Rachel has been a senior advisor to the Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute. It's a global data and intelligence business focusing on institutional investors. She is also a senior advisor at Skybridge Capital, a global investment management firm that's focused on alternative investments. Rachel has been in the region since 2008, spending a decade at Mubadala Investment Company, which is one of the region's largest sovereign wealth funds, um, helping them with their capital markets and treasury team. She managed the Asset and Liability Committee uh, of uh, Mubadala GE Capital, focusing on interest rate, foreign exchange, and cash flow risk. She's a CFA ch charter holder and a chartered treasurer. Um, in 2014, the Association of Corporate Treasurers named Rachel as the one to watch in Treasury. Um, in 2009, she published her first book, General Prints on the Globe, and helped establish a charity called Aspar that uh, so that sales proceeds could go towards supporting young entrepreneurship. So she's going to manage this event going forward. So over to her, Rachel, and this is your event. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Raju. And that's a really great initiative that you have as well regarding empowering uh, women entrepreneurs. And thanks again to Ty. Uh, for hosting this webinar today on Is Legal Tech Breaking Boundaries and the Way Law Works? Now, Raju, in his introduction, he mentioned about breaking boundaries, and we have such a stellar panel today, so I'm really excited. They are all boundary breakers in their own right. So before I hand over to introduce them, uh, I will also introduce my co-moderator, who is Dilip Massand, who's the co-founder and CEO of Phoenix Advisors. Uh, and joining me on today's panel, we have Jamie Levy, who's the General Counsel at the Abu Dhabi Investment Office. We have Dr. Mimi Zhu, co-founder of Oxford Deep Tech Resolution Lab. And we have Rishikesh Data, the CEO of VacalSearch.com. So I will hand over to the panelists to introduce themselves, but we would just like to do a quick audience poll just so that we can gauge uh, the composition of our audience today. So. First, uh, first poll, what best fits your profile? And please do scroll down because there is a second part to this question, which is which industry best fits your profile? Uh, and just as you're responding to this, uh, a little bit about today's format, it's going to be a really interactive uh, discussion between the panelists. And we also encourage questions from the audience as we go. So please, please do submit your questions. I'm sure everyone is very familiar with Zoom by now, six months into this pandemic, but just in case you're not, there's a Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. So please submit your questions this way. So as we're waiting uh, for all the, the answers to come in, it does look as though the majority of our participants today are either entre entrepreneurs or startups or small, medium businesses which is great to see. And we've got uh, over 50% from the legal industry or consulting and services. And I guess what's really interesting about this and what I find fascinating about legal, legal tech is that law really does touch all of us, you know, we've all used lawyers at some point or legal services, and I will dive into some of these things a bit later. Okay, so final results, we do have almost 50% are entrepreneurs or startups, uh, and then 43% small, medium businesses, 
with 30% from the legal industry, 17% from technology, and about a quarter, 26% from consulting or services background. So I'd now like to uh, briefly hand over to Dilip uh, Massand, my co-presenter on today's webinar, and he'll just give a very quick uh, overview and some of the statistics in the legal tech industry. Over to you, Dilip. Thanks so much, Rachel. I will definitely do my best to be quick. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say a few things um, about why we're here and frame this a little bit. So I've been a member of Thai since 1998, and I joined in New York, uh, and that was sort of the, I would say, the dot-com boom and Internet 1.0. And that time we had a venture fund and an incubator in New York City, and everything was so hyped up in Internet 1.0. It was the first time all of us had lived in a bubble. No one knew the bubble would burst. And the bubble burst, and then you live through other bubbles. And now here we are 20 plus years later, we are based in the UAE. Our investment thesis is around the legal industry. And while some of it is quite mature in terms of things we do in disputes and litigation funding, as of late, we've been hearing about legal tech and we've really been trying to understand this sector. And frankly, we don't wanna repeat mistakes of is it a bubble if we get exposed to this. So the idea was let's bring some of our friends together who are thought leaders and let's do what we would do is gather a brain trust and let's learn about this. Let's, let's understand it and let's see how viable this industry is. And I think today we've got a stellar panel. So I'm just going to share a couple of slides that our team in India put together on this sector. So I hope you can see this and I'm going to, so if you look at this, you know, obviously an emerging global legal tech community, which provides legal services. What's interesting is that you actually have incubators and accelerators open, opening around the globe and you have venture capital firms like Kosla Ventures in Silicon Valley, Y Combinator, FTV Capital, who some might call the fathers of fintech have just made a significant investment in legal tech. You've got litigation funders like Ethereum and you've got stellar VCs like Peter Thiel, who have all started investing in this sector. We also looked at a report um, dated at the end of 2019 that, that said there are almost 3,000 companies offering legal tech services. And by the end of that year, 614 companies had been funded, and it was a total of about $4.6 billion. Um, these are some of the data points from that, from that same, uh, from that same uh, report. And in that, they covered almost 3,000 companies. Again, 614 were funded, 26 were mega companies, 4.6 billion in funding, one unicorn. This I thought was really interesting, Sunicorns, and we'd have to look back and see how the pandemic affected those. Uh, Silicon Valley always comes up with things you've never heard of before, mini corns. Um, 13 were part of IPOs, 163 were acquisition exits, and 304 were dead pools. So that means companies that died by the wayside. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Again, if you look at the growth and in investment in this sector, by the end of 2019, it was hovering right around 1.2 or 1.3 billion. And now if we look at um, it from a global level, you can see that the compounded annual growth rate of legal tech companies has shown a 23% increase in funding. The sector has become very attractive. Within the sector, investors are focused on contract management, e-discovery, and legal practice management, intellectual property, and the, the delivery of forms and use of automated forms has been growing. And yes, certainly the larger players are in the US and Europe. But what I found really interesting is when you looked across the globe, you saw US, Europe, Israel, India. And uh, when you looked at the top companies in India, one of our panelists, uh, Rishikesh and Bakil Search, are among the top companies in India. So that is some of the data our team pulled. And I think it would be great to hear from our esteemed panelists as to their view on this industry and what they are doing um, to move it forward. Thanks so much, Dilip. So panelists, thank you for uh, your patience and thank you so much 
for joining us today as well. I mean, as Dilip mentioned, it really is a world-class panel of thought leaders and friends as well. So thank you so much for giving your time today. If we can just start off by having each panelist introduce themselves to the benefit of the audience. Uh, Mimi, ladies first, perhaps we start with you. Sure. Great. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, my name is Mimi Zhou. I'm the co-founder of the Deep Tech Dispute Resolution Lab at Oxford University. Um, I'm a professor of law and I am a practicing lawyer as well in the UK. Um, so I um, not only undertake research in legal tech and innovation, um, particularly in uh, civil and commercial dispute resolution, which is my area of specialization. Um, I also teach it to my students. So I think i um, very much looking forward to uh, sort of uh, contributing to this forum from both a researcher, teacher, and a practitioner perspective. Excellent. Thanks, Mimi. And Rishikesh, you're next on my screen. So could you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Rachel. Uh, my name is Rishikesh Datar. I run a company called vakeelsearch.com. Uh, we are humbled to be India's largest legal tax and compliance platform. We are building in India for the world in some sense. So what we do is we help businesses with cradle to nirvana support in terms of setting up, getting compliant, filing taxes, getting their intellectual property protected. And, you know, as things evolve, also raising funding and so on and so forth. So we act as an operating system, if you will, for small business owners to get all of their legal tax and compliance work handled. And uh, I think like uh, Dr. Mimi said, really looking forward to the questions and a very interactive session. Great, thank you, Rishi Kesh. And Jamie, please introduce yourself for the audience. Thanks very much, Rachel. Uh, thanks, to, uh, and thanks very much to Ty. Uh, I'm Jamie Levy. Uh, I'm the General Counsel of Abu Dhabi Investment Office. Uh, prior to joining Abu Dhabi Investment Office, I was a partner at KPMG uh, and led the new law uh, platform uh, in Australia, uh, looking at disrupting legal services from the big force perspective. Uh, I've been a, a general counsel at Mubadala uh, investment company in Abu Dhabi uh, for many years, uh, uh, serving alongside uh, Rachel, uh, and prior to that, a, a private equity uh, fund formation lawyer uh, and uh, an entrepreneur. Uh, very much looking forward to the discussion today and uh, hopefully bring a couple of different perspectives uh, into the frame. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Jamie. And yeah, we really do have a variety of perspectives on the on the panel today. So we hope that we have some good discussion. Uh, perhaps we can sort of start by looking, you know, industries across the world are being disrupted by technology. What areas of law do you think benefit most from being digitized? And what are some of the problems that tech can solve? Uh, Mimi, perhaps we if we start with you again on that one. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm going to pick my pet interest, um, which is on dispute resolution and um, in, in the context of access to justice. I think certainly um, the disruptions brought along by COVID-19 have seen at least temporarily um, a, uh, I would say, a slight acceleration of the efforts made by various courts around the world to go digital and to at least introduce remote hearings. Uh, still a slow process, I think, um, maybe compared to other areas of legal tech, but certainly this is one area where I think there's a lot of um, significant potential to really transform the way that our justice system is uh, delivered to the people. So in, in that sense, it, it really has a huge impact on everyone's lives. So I think um, ODR, whether it's in the court context, so, you know, um, going online partially or entirely um, in, in a court setting, or perhaps private providers of ODR, online dispute resolution, I think this area is uh, on the rise. And um, hopefully the changes we have seen during the pandemic um, will continue. Some people are skeptical, but I'm always an optimist. So I think certainly people realize how easy it is um, once you've got the right um, technical infrastructure and also the design of the system. And when I say design, it's not just about the um, technical design, it's also about 
um, the legal design, you know, how easy it is uh, and how accessible it is for users to navigate the system, to use the system and achieve an outcome quickly and efficiently um, with as few pain points in the process as possible. That's great. Thanks, Mimi. And I will come back to some of those points raised about the stickiness of the changes that we've seen during COVID as well. And uh, Jamie, we had a discussion a couple of days ago and you were talking about access to justice for all as well. Perhaps you could build on uh, Mimi's points that she made regarding that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think if we kind of step back for a moment and look at what's happening in the legal tech and legal industry space and look more at a macro area of, of what's happening in new industry and commerce, we see tremendous change being brought on by technology. And the law is not um, at all able to hide from the progression uh, that is being experienced across uh, professional services uh, in all other fields and is a laggard uh, in just about every way. Uh, so we're at the dawn of, of a 20 year transformation and when we look at um, your access to finance, which, which uh, a large number of fintech companies focused on micropayments uh, and access to financial systems are focused on solve, you know, have a tremendous, uh, trying to provide access to a legal system to the majority of the world's population that can't pick the phone up or access a lawyer. Uh, so for those people who can't, you know, legal tech um, is aimed at in many ways uh, one pillar of, of legal tech, which is quite altruistic and uh, progressive and brings access to justice to the, to the doorstep. Uh, of of the of the majority, which you know, currently doesn't really exist uh, for many parts of the world. Thanks for that, Jamie. Um, Brishikesh, I think it'd be interesting for us to hear your perspective as to who benefits from legal tech. You're working with a lot of SMEs. You know, um, is this a cost savings and efficiency saving? And you know, how has business been during COVID nineteen? Frankly. Right, so uh, thanks Dilip. You know, while Dr. Mimi and Jamie's points are uh, well taken that access to justice is gonna get transformed with legal tech, from the, from the lens where we are sitting from right here in India, uh, if you look at the problems that are on the ground, we have, you know, have 1.3 billion people, we have 63 million businesses which need legal tax and compliance support uh, to not just, survive, not just thrive but even survive. Right. So in terms of what legal tech is doing for at a very real level on the ground, it's helping these businesses get access to basic information. Now, one of the things that's, that these small businesses are deprived of is access to the kind of legal information that a large corporate or large enterprise would have. And that typically results in these companies paying a heavy penalty in terms of non-compliance. Uh, they're unable to raise capital. They're unable to scale the business. They're able to, unable to attract the right kind of talent. So legal tech actually has a very tangible impact on the economy itself by, by creating a transparent platform where any business, regardless of size, can get access to information and can get completely compliant. I think that's one of the biggest advantages and that's going to be, in my, in, in our, in my perspective, the single largest disruption that legal tech is going to have, at least in India and many other emerging markets. As far as the COVID pandemic is concerned, it's been obviously hugely disruptive uh, along with America and I think in the, the United Kingdom, India is one of the worst, most badly affected economies in the world uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, you know, in this scenario, the, the entire world is shifting online and what we have seen in the last four months has been a 25% month on month growth. So as a legal tech company, I think Vakil Search has done really well in the pandemic because the entire economy, the entire market is shifting online. The economy and small businesses obviously have been completely battered. So we have to wait and watch what the recovery curve looks like, but it has unwittingly been an impetus for legal tech in this country. So COVID-19 for legal tech has been positive, but for the economy as, as a whole, it's been very negative. Mimi, I'm wondering, we just heard from Rishikesh uh, from an Indian perspective about 
the opportunity. I know you do a lot of work uh, with China and, and uh, what's going on there in uh, ODR, et cetera. Mm. Is there similar migration and has that been affected by this current pandemic? It'd be really interesting to hear from your perspective what legal tech is in China as well now and you know where that's going. Sure. Um, I might just focus on um, courts and the digitization of justice in China because that's the area I know most um, most familiar with. Um, I mean, rather than, I mean, I could give you a lecture, which is what, what, not what you want on, on legal tech generally in China, but I think um, given the points that have been raised so far, it's very interesting to see how, you know, this is the biggest country in the world and, you know, arguably um, the most technologically uh, advanced, um, perhaps along with the US, but let's not go into the geopolitics. Uh, but what China has done in its courts um, has actually established a framework, um, uh, not just in, in terms of infrastructure, but also a regulatory framework and policy framework to support the digitalization of justice. Um, and that is actually part of the judicial reforms um, to make the courts in China more transparent um, and more accountable. So that's slightly different context um, in terms of a policy context compared to perhaps other digital um, reforms that are going on in say the courts of UK, where I am currently, where certainly access to justice is, is certainly one of the primary uh, drives for um, UK courts reforms in this area. So China, I think what is uh, marvelous about what they have been doing is even before the pandemic, um, for the last five to six years, they have set up this framework um, it is technical infrastructure, but also this policy regulatory framework that um, from the top down directs pretty much every judge, every court um, in its system to deploy new technologies. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've, um, I'm very good friends with the director of the Information and Technology Center in the Supreme People's Court of China. Uh, I have seen um, firsthand just how centralized and how advanced that technology is. I mean, this is a country that um, deals with 22 million cases a year, 22 million cases a year. And so, um, yes, it is the biggest country in the world, but I mean, in terms of the number of judges, the ratio of judges to cases, um, on average, if you're a lower court, uh, lower level court judge, you would be dealing with about 250, 300 cases a year. So um, it is, it is the, for this reason that, um, you know, even before the pandemic, China has really sought to um, address um, digital, the digitalization of judicial services um, very quickly, very rapidly, and it can because of the system that um, you know, it is in. So uh, we see that this is actually a transformation of courts, which we have yet to see, and I think in other jurisdictions. Um, again, you know, I think the worry is whether we just kind of go um, digital just for the sake of going digital, or actually are we moving sort of from a traditional kind of concept of a courtroom, not just in terms of its physical brick and mortar form, but actually transforming the civil procedures that come with it to transform the policy and regulatory frameworks that come with it. And so I think um, there's obviously lessons we can learn from what the Chinese have been doing. But again, I always have to emphasize that, um, you know, it is, it is often challenging to do what they do, um, given also the very significant differences in legal and political systems around the world. And what I find, you know, interesting when you're looking at legal tech is, you know, it's so closely tied to, I guess, regulation um, and compliance. And sometimes this almost drives to the commercial opportunity, as it were, like changing compliance, changing regulations. Well, you know, I think, um, Jamie, we were discussing the other day about the Volcker rule and how that sort of spurred on perhaps a really big commercial opportunity in legal tech. Could you maybe talk a bit more about how that would play into AI and machine learning in the legal tech space? Yeah, sure. 
and look to to pick up on what Mimi was saying there. I think we we are already seeing the impact of automation, uh, document ingestion, uh, and artificial intelligence in the administration of law. So I'll pick up on, on the commercial side in a, in a moment, but really do agree there with Mimi that um, when we look at what's happening in the US um, court legal system at the moment around the use of artificial intelligence and technology to support judges quick on a scalable basis, you yeah, end up with a more efficient legal system that is hopefully grounded in uh, technology and ethical principles and legal principles that give the right you know, judicial outcome to, uh, to, to the cases that they seek. That, that I think also provides a, a huge area, which I'm not sure we've got time to talk about today, around ethics in, in, uh, in legal tech and whether or not you'd be comfortable as uh, you know, a plaintiff or, or, or a defendant in a, in a case, um, knowing that you've got a robo-judge uh, you know, potentially feeding into you know, your future. And there's a lot of people out there that actually say, um, you know, I'd be more comfortable knowing that bias is perhaps taken to a degree out of the system uh, you know, where, the, where we've got uh, a robo-judge in, in play versus uh, a, a human, um, but then we look also through uh, the basis of the data and the principles that the data is grounded in to determine is the system itself uh, in the future and at this point going to be grounded in a degree of bias given uh, you know, the originators of the technology solutions that will drive you know, the, legal, the legal profession and, and those kind of systems. And those systems are also being leveraged in the commercial space. And we look at you know, big insurance companies at the moment and, and how they come to very quickly be able to make decisions as to whether to make a payout on a claim through automation technology and determining on the basis of the facts you know, whether or not they're liable and ought to make a decision. And you know, the, the level of processing of claims below certain, certain thresholds is now being done in you know, below a second uh, for some of the largest uh, you know, insurance companies in the world through you know, digi digital solutions and automation solutions. Um, so I think on the, on the administration of justice side, just as you see in the kind of, you know, look at the medical profession, you see, you know, surgeons working with machines, working with robots to perform complex surgery, you now see a way to provide, you know, an outcome in respect of the administration of, of our profession and justice. Yeah, for, for those on the call who are, who are the entrepreneurs and the SMEs and, and looking at, you know, what, what does this mean for them? Uh, I think, you know, in the commercial sense, there's never been a more exciting time to either practice law or, or be able to get access to, you know, fantastic lawyers, you know, in, in, under new commercial models. You know, the law has been a space um, you know, where privileged law firms who for many years have not been able to market services because of the, the laws and re you know, regulations that govern um, the provision of legal services have now moved into an era, era where a, a good lawyer with a laptop's much better uh, and, and provides a greater access to legal outcomes and advice than you know, a, a, mid, a mid law firm 10 years ago. Uh, the access to technology solutions you know, provides for different business models as well. Very hard to tell a law firm where most, most good law firms are operating at a greater than kind of 50% profit margin that they've got broken business models. When if you look at the reality of how these commercial business models are, are, work, uh, are, are in operation, you've got a scenario where uh, there's a lot of fat in the system. Uh, and that fat is at the end of the day being borne by the SMEs and the consumers. And the fact is just like uh, you know, in the FinTech space looking to disrupt finance, you've got, and, and which has successfully done so in many, in many states and making the world, make, make the world's uh, you know, largest financial institutions really take note of those that don't have large balance sheet being able to take on board significant customer bases to provide you know, lending lending solutions. We've got a scenario now where um, you know, legal tech driven and digital technology service driven firms are able to challenge um, the traditional stakeholders and the traditional uh, leaders in the sector um, by virtue of being forward thinking and not, you know, not being a business based on you know, charging in six minute increments or the weight of paper, which wasn't so long ago. Uh, so you know, for, for many SMEs, they'll be able to access documentation, be able to automate sales agreements, uh, be able to take the legal operation side of what was and has been for many years a very um, inefficient system that's rewarded by inefficiency, even in the manner in which clients pay fees. 
you know, based on how much time it takes. And that whole challenge to time that's being you know, brought by technology and automation solutions, I think, will deliver um, and continue to deliver technology dividends to clients. And those clients who don't demand it now uh, will be demanding it, and many are already demanding to know how will you use as a legal professional technology to ensure I get the best advice from the best lawyer using the right technology that ensures you know, I can get across as much of the documentation as I can. I produce the documentation through an automated sense, using machine learning and natural language processing technologies to review documentation and to ensure that you know, we're not lawyering like we did 10 years or 50 years ago. Um, and really that requires you know, a new mindset for a lot of the lawyers, which we're seeing come through in you know, the manner in which lawyers are now educated through universities and how tech savvy lawyers have to be today. I mean, my first, my first piece of legal tech was probably a dictaphone you know, 20 years ago. And if I look at you know, what I do now, and what I demand of lawyers, and you mentioned the Volcker rule there and, and you know, the example I gave you the other day, you know, you've got scenarios now where people come with just impossible problems. You know, I come to my lawyers with impossible problems. Review, and in that scenario, it was millions of pages of documentation for you know, leading regulatory authorities worldwide. And lawyers and accountants, tax consultants, you know, scratch their heads saying, well, how are we going to solve that kind of a problem? And now we actually have built solutions where document ingestion machines can ingest millions of pages, discern issues, automate issues lists, you know, automate documentation, provide data analytics overlays, and help you understand where the issues are. Um, and I think from a compliance perspective, where you mentioned earlier uh, as well, that, that kind of document review tool, which sounds kind of sci-fi in the future, is here now. Uh, and if we're not, Utilising that in the context of the new digital economy that's, that's emerged you know, globally, uh, then you know, the law's even further disconnected from the reality of commerce. And my view is that you know, the digital world, the digital economy must be supported by the right legal frameworks, lawyers and technology solutions to allow for efficiency in the system. And if one is so disconnected from the other, then you've, you've got a break in the system. And what we're trying to do, I think, in legal tech at the moment on the commercial side, is to ensure that the legal operations um, that we see uh, within the administration of and provision of legal services, you know, together with the commercial models for delivering on legal services, actually are, are forced to and thrust into the current digital economy, availing of yeah, internet of things, artificial intelligence, automation solutions, uh, and in doing so provide for a great new world of opportunity for lawyers and entrepreneurs in respect of legal services. I think those 50% of uh, people on the call that were SMEs, well, it will be music to their ears that the six-minute bill billing model is going out the door, that's for sure. Um, I know, Dilip, you've just unmuted yourself, so I think you have a question too, but if I could just ask Rishikesh. Um, you know, Jamie mentioned machine learning and AI as a... As a um, you know, provider of, of legal tech services. How are you using them within your business? Right. So I think the first thing that we need to keep in mind is uh, how we define legal tech. So if we define legal tech as something which makes a lawyer's life simpler, then by that sort of broad definition, even an Excel spreadsheet is legal tech. And even Microsoft Word is legal tech. Right. So uh, the important thing to, for the purpose of this conversation is to not define legal tech too broadly, but to narrow it down to that level of disruptive innovation, which is going to take the legal industry to the next level. So I think Dr. Mimi spoke about online dispute resolution, which is a very classic example of how AI and machine learning is going to replicate how a human being would think and how a human being would resolve a dispute. Uh, so to come to your question for a minute, uh, Rachel, how are we using machine learning? I think the biggest use case for machine learning at Wakil Search is in automation. Uh, so what machine learning does for the benefit of those uh, who might not have heard the term being used very often is it in very simple English, machine learning helps to train a machine to do a repetitive task with a basic level of logic and some algorithms built into it. Right? So machine learning is basically helping a machine replicate, do, a lot, do repetitive tasks uh, in a systematic and highly, highly efficient way. Uh, artificial intelligence adds on top of that, adds a layer of what we would call human thought. 
right? So the ability to choose between outcomes and then decide what outcome fits the particular situation best. So to give you some examples of how we use machine learning and AI, uh, trademark registration, trademark filing, for example, which is a big business case. A lot of Indian companies now want to protect their brand. They want to protect their either their trademark or their copyright or their patent. And they want to make sure that they get certified quickly. Right? How, do we, how do we help millions of businesses do trademark filing at scale? So what we have done is we have built a bot which will basically collect all the information, do a trademark search online in a matter of a few seconds, then prepare a trademark. There are a couple of forms which we need to file in India. So basically prepare those forms and then log into the trademark portal. All of this happens without a single human being's click. And log into the trademark portal, update information, make the required government payments, the fee payments, and then submit the application. So while a human being would take close to an hour to file one trademark application, the bot can simultaneously file multiple applications in seconds. That's a combination of machine learning, uh, some amount of artificial intelligence, and of course, computer vision, natural language processing, and you know, basic automation, uh, it's called robotic process automation. So it's a bunch of things coming together, uh, which is transforming, sort of taking legal to the next level. Uh, so this is one in one example of how it can be done. It can be done just as well for tax filing. It can be done very well for setting up a business. It can be done for drafting a document or a contract. It can, it can be done for reviewing a contract. So all of the things which SMEs would have to, like Jamie mentioned, pay lawyers in six minute increments for, can now be done with a highly sophisticated platform at a very small fraction of what an SME would pay. And then I think, uh, and just sort of building on that point, and um, Mimi and Jamie have touched on it as well, how do you take the bias out of that system? So when there are objections to sort of standard applications, how do you manage that? And I guess that also comes to the robo-judge point. How do you manage contestation uh, against claims? So I'm going to take uh, you know, Mimi's point and keep the geopolitics out of it. But my personal opinion is that, you know, you can only have a robot judge in a free market, in a free economy, right? Where there's free press and there is actually checks and balances in the system. So if you have a centralized state, which is sort of controlling everything, uh, and you also have that the robot judge created by the state to resolve disputes where the state is involved, right? Then the possibility of bias is extremely high to the point where me as a citizen, I would not trust the robot judge. On the other hand, if you have an independent uh, free thinking judiciary, then yes, theoretically a, a robot judge would be a huge asset. Uh, India as a country has, you know, while there's been a lot of private innovation in legal tech, on the regulatory, on the government side, we're seeing that the system moves a little too slowly. Uh, we don't have the kind of innovation in, the, in justice delivery as we would like to have. There are some green shoots now in the pandemic, but I think there's some way away from that. I think a robot judge would be phenomenal for things like consumer disputes, like disputes between a, con a, a, between a consumer and a company, or a very standardized situation of a check bouncing, right? You give somebody a check and it bounces. So when you have the basic documentation in place and it's, you know, it's a binary problem in some sense, like did you lend this person money or not, right? Or did you buy this product or not? Uh, for all of those cases, which in, from a volumetric standpoint is a good 20, 30% of the entire you know, case backlog in most countries, I think a robot judge would be a great innovation. Uh, as you go up, up the, up the you know, difficulty scale or difficulty index, then especially where the state, where the government is involved, then a, a robot judge, I think we are a few years away from it. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I think we are a few years away from that. But I just want to add here that we are very focused on the business and SME space. I think Dr. Mimi is far more qualified to give you uh, the nuances of how legal tech is working for AI than I am. No, I thought that was very good. <laughs> very nicely put. Thank you for that, Rishikesh. You know, I wanted to back up a little bit, Mimi, and ask you, based on some of the things Jamie said, uh, when he was talking about, you know, lawyers needing new skills, new opportunities, we have an audience of entrepreneurs, um, and you're in a faculty of law, you've got the Deep Tech Dispute Resolution Lab. I'm curious, the students that you are working with, are they looking for new skills? Are they looking at the law now as an entrepreneurial area? Are they working on projects there that may, you know, come out and become actual businesses? Uh, if you could maybe shed some light and your thoughts on that would be great. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I'm totally inspired by my students. Um, just really, I feel like um, I wish I was 20 again. Um, you know, the, the, the pace at which they pick this up is just amazing. Um, you know, I'm, I've been trying to learn learn more programming and get my head around um, you know the more technical aspects of legal tech. Um, I certainly am the legal side of legal tech in the projects that I've been involved in um, but I, I can talk to obviously the computer scientists and we have a number of these computer scientists in our lab. Um, the, it's hard though, it's really hard. I mean I just give you an example, we were talking um, earlier this week in our weekly stand-ups um, about the project and the lawyers just talked and then I said to the computer scientists how much of that did you actually understand and the computer scientists are usually a bit quieter so they don't actually say um, I'm sorry I actually don't understand and, and it was just silence and I was like all right let's guys let's go back to step one you know okay all right what does this legal concept mean um, and so I think, at least in our lab, I'm trying to run an experiment in terms of seeing how we can get different disciplines to talk to each other. Um, because I think the truly, um, the truly uh, amazing synergies that we see the most successful legal tech businesses out there are those that really are able to um, maximize the full potential of people from different backgrounds. And so that's what I've been trying to encourage my students. Unfortunately, our curriculum um, is much more behind. Uh, that we can say that also about law and regulation, as technology, you know, is ex ex accelerating exponentially. Unfortunately, particularly in a place like Oxford, our curriculum is still, uh, in, in many ways, reflects the um, the length of the the history and tradition that um, you know the, our institution is known for. Um, but we are trying to have these new kind of academic and industry benches where I partner with um, uh, organizations in startups, um, government bodies, to try and deliver projects that are multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder. And the students are very excited. And I think that's, that's where my hope is, is in this next generation of um, lawyers, but also you know, students from other disciplines who are interested in law, legal tech, um, and hopefully that will make the difference. Great, thanks Mimi. Um, we have had a couple of audience questions come in and I'd, one of them uh, sort of more focused on the commercial side and uh, the competitive landscape. I'd just like to actually also ask a polling question um, from the audience. Cicely, if you could please release the last question on would you invest in a legal tech company uh, and this sort of ties into one of the questions that we've had from the audience as well. So we have yes it sounds promising, no the industry is too new, maybe I would wait and watch for later or I don't know. Well that's good, as the, um, as the answers are coming in it looks like the panellists have managed to uh, convince the audience that yes it does sound promising so that's great. Um, I will, while the answers are coming in I'd like to address one of the questions from the audience from Klaus. Thanks for your question Klaus. Um, so in Dilip's intro slides he referred to Peter Thiel as an investor in tech. However Peter has become well known for saying competition is for losers and he also appears to be recommending startups to aim at being monopolies. How does that in your view, and this is for all, all the panelists, sit with currently existing laws, e.g. Anti, antitrust to stimulate competition, would you see conflict of interest arising if investors in legal tech are actually encouraging or suggesting to ignore or bypass existing laws? Sorry, that's a long question, but who would like to tackle that one from Klaus? I think I'll take that. Hi, guys. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I'll give you my personal opinion. So I don't think that any market economy should have competition law, uh, at least the kind of competition law that we're seeing increasingly growing, right, in these countries. So it's just a way to stifle competition. Ultimately, the market always wins. So if you if you provide a product that can pro can satisfy a consumer's needs at the right price, 
the consumer is going to is going to opt for the product uh, so i think competition law is an unfortunate intersection of the regulatory landscape with business i think the regulatory structure and businesses have to be kept separate businesses have to be allowed to thrive uh, and yes uh, i don't i don't think in any real market uh, in any market as new as legal tech anyway we are going to see any any real monopolies for a while i think legal tech is going to continue to be extremely competitive and that's a good thing uh, we're going to see a lot of young companies getting into this space uh, aggressively competing for market share some companies are going to get larger than the others that's obvious that's the law of the farm but i don't think we're really going to see any monopolies and if any investor is going to encourage his company to be a monopoly that's obvious that's that's the obvious competitive thrust which an investor is going to push a company to go ahead and achieve and dominate the market but domination is not the same thing as a monopoly so i think that investor push to dominate markets is always going to be there legal tech is no exception uh, but it's not going to hurt the industry it's going to really help the industry because the moment you have two people trying to dominate the market together then great outcomes come out of it right great better prices uh, better quality better technology more investments and then it becomes a virtuous cycle where things just keep getting better and right so I'll give you a, a different a slightly different view on on that one like as as well when you look at i think trying to create a monopoly what I like about the sentiment there is trying to find a, a solution to a problem that no one else has solved trying to carve out a swim lane you know and a business model that addresses a significant market opportunity that is unoccupied um and that's a that's a tremendous opportunity for an investor uh you know to come in and take an interest in at an early stage i think the reality at the moment for you know a trillion dollar industry like the law with at least last my last read of around 16 billion dollars in dry dry powder in private equity funds and others looking at technology led solutions and investment not necessarily just in law but in new business models driven by traditional service service offerings and law absolutely fits into the uh, the kind of investment criteria of those funds you've got you know a, a great opportunity to see the right businesses attacking the right problems come out with business models that can uh, you know be scalable and create you know great investment opportunities for for investors but at the same time if people are looking for you know creating a monopoly and creating a or trying to create you know, something where nobody is there might be a reason nobody's in that space uh i've recently had you know a, a legal tech firm call me i get it regularly you know can we talk to you about a particular you know legal tech um you know piece of kit that you might like to see Jamie i'll say yes to you know some of these you know where i've got an interest and and one of them actually you know was looking at trying to help me understand where my whip is that the work in progress within a law firm to understand my budget implications and legal procurement needs to try to better manage cash flow which is obviously one of the kind of front front of mind issues for CEOs and CFOs you know drive efficiency into the business including with respect to um traditional cost centers in a business one of which is the legal budget so any you know legal tech company that you know comes to a CFO and says hey how i give you an idea to uh, to halve your legal um e external legal spend it generally is going to be met with you know an interest from a lot of a lot of players and a lot of companies particularly those with legal budgets you know in excess of 10 million dollars of which there are many in the world you know, it could be you where you've got many large large organizations with a legal budget of more than 70 million dollars so th there are a, i think some great opportunities there but if and going back to that example briefly the whole tech piece and play was about trying to tell me as a general counsel where my whip is in a law firm's uh in a law firm context telling me basically what's on the clock and what could I potentially be up to paying i don't really care what the whip is the firm can be as inefficient as it likes i'm going to pay what i agree in the engagement letter to pay uh and the fact that there's a piece of legal tech that might tell me where they're about to go over on the budget that we've agreed yeah is useful for them to help manage my expectations but as an end user I'm the wrong consumer for that particular product and from a legal tech perspective the law firm has got better legal procurement tools than that specific point product so we end up then in a in a kind of i think really interesting scenario that we are today which is you know which point products are actually winners in and of themselves and which are going to be failing companies 
which will result in consolidation opportunities for the Thomson Reuters of the world to come in and mop up a whole lot of businesses which created some value for someone at some point, but didn't have a business model that actually worked um, in the, the new economy that we have, uh, the new propositions that we have uh, presented to us from the post-COVID world. And I think we'll see a lot of consolidation in this space. Uh, some winners, many losers. And to Dilip's earlier point around, you know, bubbles, I don't see this as a bubble at all at this stage. Um, I, I noted with interest the, the M&A, uh, you know, uh, stat that you put there, Dilip, Dilip. Um, there's a very limited number of exits in that 168 number at this point. Um, there'll be plenty of write-offs and write-downs in those asset, those investments as well, but there'll be some tremendous in the trillion dollar industry that hasn't really had a technical basis. Thanks for that, Jamie. I have to ask you, and um, please, Mimi, Rishikesh, you know, feel free to jump in. You know, we've heard about, and we see what is happening in India. We see the volume of the legal tech industry. Mimi's given us some insight into really the use of robo judges in the courts. We know what she's doing in the, in the ac academic world and what they're trying to do at Oxford. What do you see in the region? Here we are, this is Thai Dubai, we're in the Middle East, we've got quite an entrepreneurial audience. Do you think there is scope for this in the region? Is it too early? Are we still at stage one of FinTech? This comes next, et cetera? Look, I'll give you a kind of frame through which I look at that kind of issue uh, through at the moment. Um, I think firstly, we live in a global uh, world. And I think it's very difficult now to discern regional issues from global issues. Uh, you know, digital trade and international trade uh, is such that you know, the region's always been and will be a fantastic time zone and, and uh, uh, you know, a ge ge geographically located place for tremendous amounts of international trade to go through. Um, but you know, big players in the world expect uh, you know, business models to be done in a, in a manner that's most efficient. And we don't exclude, I think, uh, the Middle East uh, and the region from the opportunities that that presents, um, all the requirements that those firms uh, and organisations have and demands they have, as well as their supply chains. Uh, so I think in the, you know, in the, from a regional perspective, we're seeing uh, uh, organisations embrace technology solutions they don't care whether we call it legal tech or not. They want automation. Um, they want to understand data analytics and how it's what its implications are um, for services, for supply chains, and for you know, international and digital trade. And a lot of that then simply requires the the pillars of of services that of one of which is legal services that underpins and delivers these uh, you know, delivers on the promises of these industries to be. Uh, robust and available to them. So legal tech in the, in, in the industry uh, you know, itself as it applies to the region, um, I think is you know, it's early stage for the region, but um, absolutely will come uh, along with the rest of the world when it comes to uh, its, its level of, of uh, enthusiasm for and, and take up of, of technology solutions, particularly I see in the automation space. Uh, I think secondly, look at you know, the other big global markets and you know, the world's first digital courts uh, that, are, that are sitting there at the ADGM in Almaria Island. And you've got a world-class uh, jurisdiction driven by digital uh, solutions, fully automated, combining the best legal minds in the world with the right technology solutions to focus on, you know, outcomes and justice in a traditional, uh, you know, sense. And, you know, I think that's an incredibly inspiring uh, outcome for Abu Dhabi, uh, one which, uh, you know, obviously, you know, is a credit to the leadership of Abu Dhabi. And, uh, you know, we see there that that's a leading, uh, you know, world-class leading uh, jurisdiction uh, driven by the, the digital court. So when we look at, you know, through that lens as well, um, I, I'm inspired and, and to use, you know, Dr. Mimi's words too, very optimistic uh, around what legal tech um, you know, implications there are for you know, trade and commerce in the region. So Mimi, Rishikesh, that was clearly an open invitation from Jamie for you to come to Abu Dhabi, come to the region and uh, help 
help him uh, grasp that opportunity that he himself is defining here. <laughs> sure, absolutely. When it, when the pandemic's over, I'm on the first flight there. Absolutely. Yeah, and you know, Dilip and I are both both uh, tenants of ADGM, and certainly the work that they're doing and the Abu Dhabi Investment Office is, is doing in general for the entrepreneurial ecosystem is really great. Um, as usual, the time has gone extremely fast and we're actually already over time, but I would like to ask one closing question to the panelists, and that is what is sort of your prediction or hope for the future of legal tech over the next, say, five years? And Rishikesh, your microphone is unmuted, so you can go first. Sure, Rachel, thanks. So I think that what's going to happen in legal tech uh, is that you're going to see a lot of synergies being built with other areas of technology like fintech, for example. Uh, so a lot of what, ha what is happening in fintech, specifically around automation, around, around robotic processes, around you know, machine learning, computer vision, all of those things are going to get absorbed into legal tech as well. So legal tech is going to sort of ride the wave is what I is the way I look at it. And I know like uh, Jamie and Dr. Mimi, I'm extremely optimistic about uh, what's going to happen in the next three, four years. Sitting where I'm sitting, especially in markets like India and emerging markets where there's a sort of hunger to grow and you know hunger to sort of expand and go to the next level. I think legal tech is going to really add impetus. It's going to be a tailwind. Uh, and in that sense, it's going to benefit from not just other areas of engineering, but also from the markets sort of gravitating towards technology uh, for delivery of services. So for both of those reasons, I think that the next five years are going to be very, very exciting. Thanks, Rishikesh. Mimi. I think my vision, I think, would be that it will make the legal system and how people interact with the law on a day to day basis better, just to put it like that. So there will always Thank be a need. So there, I think there's always a need. This industry is, is, is here to stay. Yeah, it certainly does affect everyone. And Jamie, your prediction or hope for the next five years? Uh, look, I, I think it will present tremendous opportunity to those who are positioning themselves to be able to take advantage of it. I think it will change the way uh, lawyers are educated. It will change the way law firms are structured. It will change the number of job opportunities that there are in the law. When I went through university um, to be a lawyer, uh, I was able to study law to be a lawyer. I think now you've got data scientists that would like to specialise in the area of law. You've got legal operations specialists. You've got administration folk who are going to be get the, the tip um, of the spear when it comes to the, uh, the delivery of either legal services or the provision of them um, if you're, if you're in-house. Uh, and I think we'll see, um, you know, an, a, a huge take up in automation solutions and contract automation and document uh, review technologies um, emerge that will be applied from the area of e-discovery into the commercial application world. Um, but five years um, is, a, is a tremendously long period of time for where we are right now. But if you look at it in the context of 100 years of almost no change in the, uh, in the legal profession, I think five years you'll see you know, massive amounts of digitization that really just follow, you know, what two thirds of the world CEOs are demanding in any event that legal services become more efficient, um, that we that we look at the law as part of an ecosystem that is, you know, on a digital transformation journey itself. And we'll see some huge winners in this scenario, many of whom we've not yet heard of today. Fabulous. Thank you, Jamie. And yes, you're right. Five years or some perhaps a bit too long a time frame for an area that's, that's changing as quickly as this. Um, a couple of housekeeping points just quickly before I wrap things up. There is one final poll. would just like to get some feedback from the audience uh, on today's session. But, you know, I really did want to thank firstly Ty Dubai for hosting this, this webinar today on such, you know, such an important topic. I don't come from a legal background, but I have been impacted by legal technology and it really is something that does affect everyone. 
And we had such a stellar group of panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Mimi, Jamie, Rishikesh, and Dilip. Great to have you participate. Um, as always, I really hope that we can do what allows us to do so. Uh, Dilip, would you like to? I'll hand over to you. I know you like the closing word. No, no. I just want to thank this brilliant panel for helping us with some of our investment thesis. We were definitely cheating and we were using your intelligence to come to some conclusions. Um, so thank you, Ty, for allowing us to do that. Thank you all. And, um, you know, I'm sure we'll all be together again in this uh, virtual atmosphere sometime soon. So thank you. <laughs>